very warm welcome to all of you joining us here um, from all over the world. I am, for those of you who don't know me, Shirley Gilbert. I'm Professor of Modern Jewish History at UCL, University College London. Um, and I'm also the Academic Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre, which was established in memory of the late British historian. Um, Sir Martin was, of course, the official biographer of Winston Churchill, um, but he also published dozens of other books on primarily 20th century topics, including the World Wars, Modern Jewish Life, and Israel. Um, and he, of course, also wrote many books on the Holocaust, including an extensive overview history, which was first published back in 1986, as well as a series of historical atlases and various other accounts relating to the Holocaust. And it's this area of Sir Martin's work that we are focusing on tonight as we mark the eve of Yom HaShoah, which is the Jewish day of Holocaust remembrance and corresponds to the 27th of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar. And this year on Yom HaShoah, we are marking the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, in order to mark Yom HaShoah, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome today Professor Mike Umbach, who is a leading historian of the Holocaust and one of those rare scholars who puts a great deal of time and effort into engaging not only with her fellow academics, but also with public audiences. Uh, and she does it extremely well, I might say. Um, and that work of making connections between historians and public audiences is one of our main aims here at the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center. We want to make academic historical research as accessible and as exciting as possible. Um, and that's something that Sir Martin himself was particularly skilled at doing. And we offer a wide program of events across the year on the various subjects that Sir Martin spent his life exploring. And before I introduce Mike properly, I will make a quick plug for support and say that as a small charity, we really rely on your donations so that we can keep reaching those wide audiences uh, and crucially keep our events free at the point of access. So any contributions are gratefully received uh, and it's very easy to don donate um, on our website. You'll see a big, a big orange donate button. So to turn to our esteemed guest, uh, Maiken is Professor of Modern History at the University of Nottingham here in the UK. Uh, and she is also the chief academic advisor at the National Holocaust Museum, uh, which was formerly known as Beth Shalom. Some of you um, may know that name. Um, Maiken has a long and distinguished record of research and publications in German history. Uh, I'll tell you just about her current research um, in which she's focused on the role of photography in how we think about and research and teach about National Socialism and the Holocaust. And that's what she's going to be talking to us about tonight. Her most recent books um, and publications on that topic include the co-authored book, Photography, Migration and Identity, A German Jewish American Story. That was published in 2018. Um, and she's also published the edited volume, Private Life and Privacy in Nazi Germany. That was published in 2019. So Michael, Mike and will speak tonight for about 40 minutes. And after that, we'll open the floor up for your questions and comments, please post those questions or comments in the chat. You can either send them privately to me uh, or to everyone. Please don't then send them to Mike and I'll be um, looking through them and then I will um, pose them to her after the talk. So without further ado, I will pass on to Mike and for her talk, which is titled Photographing Departures and Arrivals, Picturing Global Jewish Migrations in the Era of the Holocaust. Mike and go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Charlie, is it there? Yes. Okay, so I want to talk to you today about uh, photography as a source in documenting or under better understanding the huge waves of flight, refugeedom, migration, resettlement of Jewish people, uh, that were triggered by Nazi persecution and the Holocaust. Now, of course, this is a huge topic and I'm not going to begin to cover it adequately. I want to focus on a few case studies to make some points about what this medium contributes to uh, the story. Um, second. Um, so photos, why are photos interesting for this? Um, photos, I would argue, double-trying to show as I, I, I talk you through specific examples, 
uh, are a really fascinating source because they force people to position themselves in relation to environments, in relation to places. Most photography, especially in, in that period when you know, technology isn't what it is today with the smartphones, is outdoor photography. So it's always about situating the self in a, in a public space, a public arena, and making some kind of commentary about the relationship between the private self and the social spaces around it in a way in which other documents such as diaries or letters can sometimes be quite quiet. There's uh, secondly, the fact that a lot of these photos are preserved in photo albums made by private people in, in, in this time about their experiences. You also get the narrative of placing photos in a certain order and captioning them and so on, which I think offers us fantastic insights into that patterning of continuity and change before, during, and after migration. There's also uh, an interesting practice, uh, question about what photography shows. Photography is not just capturing, uh, documenting what happened. Photography can itself be a powerful prompt for behaving in certain ways. So posing in a particular setting in front of an important monument, a building or a very meaningful landscape, or with other people uh, is often something that is done specifically for the camera because the camera is present. So it's not so much about documenting the realities of everyday life. It's often about documenting aspirations, what one wants to be recorded about the self, about one's experience of that time. And quite often it's about futures that are, are hoped for and anticipated, if you like, through the medium of photography. So it's not it's not a source for everyday life so much as, as if you like getting inside, pe inside people's minds and understanding what their, their hopes and their aspirations are. So there's a really annoying lag between changing the slides. Hmm, now it isn't changing at all. There we go. Um, in this talk today, I'm going to focus on two case studies in particular of two Germans, two families. They're both uh, German Jewish families. They're both from Berlin originally, but their journeys take them to very different destinations. Uh, New York in one instance and Nahria in the north of what is now Israel in the other case. Um, and through this comparison of these two stories, I'm going to raise some questions about uh, in what these stories are very individual and very specific, but are there nevertheless specific patterns that we can detect that run across them and thousands of other stories that were narrated through the medium of photography in this way? And I've indicated there with these subheadings, a few of the common themes that I want to pick out that run through both of these different stories. So let me begin with the the first story. It's the story of a German Jewish family from Berlin called the Salzmanns. Um, and the story uh, was one that I stumbled across by accident. I'm hoping for the slide to advance at some point. I don't know why it's so laggy. Um, so I was, uh, for completely different reasons, at the University of Iowa um, and happened to stumble across this incredible collection in the archives there. And this itself, I think, is significant because Holocaust museums like the one that I work for uh, have collected the testimonies of Holocaust survivors, sometimes also artifacts and personal photos donated by these people. Um, but uh, that's a particular selection, if you like, of people who very consciously identify as Holocaust survivors. A lot of these stories are relating to families who have migrated um, are not in archives like that because these people don't, or at least not primarily, identify as Holocaust survivors, although objectively that is what they are. Um, but they are Jewish families who had their lives in Germany and then rebuilt their lives after fleeing discrimination and uh, exclusion and so on, uh, rebuild their lives in new countries. And that is what their archives document. And they then donated them 
uh, very often to museums or archives that uh, have to do with the histories of those countries rather than with the histories of the Holocaust per se. So I think to capture this incredibly important story of millions of Holocaust refugees, we need to look beyond what is in the collections of classical Holocaust museums. So the Salzman story in this archive at Iowa, uh, leading to a book that I have since published uh, on, on that, mostly focused on that particular case study, set in a wider historical context. So I'm gonna talk you through that first, and then we're gonna move on to the second case study, very different story, and yet some really interesting common themes. So the first thing that emerges very prominently has to do with the history of World War I, um, in which uh, Jewish men fought uh, very valiantly alongside their non-Jewish counterparts as part of the, the German army. And this is something that is in the records of most private Jewish family archives from this period that I have seen. Um, on the left here, you see Hans and Otto Salzmann, uh, Hans the younger one on the right, uh, this is before the First World War, uh, but in wearing the patriotic uh, Navy costume, that sort of sign of identifying the modernity, exciting modernity of German armed forces at the time. The older brother, uh, Otto, uh, is already training to be um, an, an officer. And Otto uh, was killed quite early in action during the First World War, uh, whereas Hans survived. Uh, photos on the right are uh, photos from uh, Hans's photo album of the First World War. Like many other German soldiers, he took his own personal camera to war uh, and photographed lots of things, uh, but, but was particularly fascinated, as many of his non-Jewish counterparts were, by French landscapes and the ruins of French Gothic churches and Gothic cathedrals that, you know, even in their destroyed nature, had a, had a certain romantic majesty, and this is what his many of his photos from this time capture. So it's very much about writing the personal experience into the story of the German nation at war. Um, in the interwar period, the tenor of the album shifts towards uh, leisure, uh, travel, uh, and uh, through both of these uh, documenting one's participation in a, a self-consciously kind of modern and exciting new age. Here we see the Salzmann family on holiday in Italy. Um, and one thing that is interesting is, is not just you know, this kind of glamorous uh, uh, holiday experience, but also if you look on the right-hand side, the aesthetics of the photography itself is, is, is part of how the story is told. These are not just snapshots, right? They're, they're attempting to do something very very meaningful, something very beautiful with the photography, playing with the, the geometric shapes, interesting perspectives, the play of, of sunlight and, 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 and shadows. So photography is an exciting new medium. It's only just become accessible to a mass audience with the invention in the 1920s of the very easy to use handheld camera. So you no longer need a tripod. You no longer have these big boxes. You have something that you can just pull out and press the shutter, and uh, Leica was the first of its type patented in 1925, and then lots and lots of cheaper copy models followed by other makers that Salzmann's had a Leica camera, so this is their photographing their experience. They're also um, in, in this way participating their membership in a sort of German culture of, of being part of the, the educated middle class. What they, There's this wonderful untranslatable German word called the Bildung, which is education, but it's also character formation. And in that, an engagement with the classical tradition was always paramount. It still is to some extent in, in the German education system. So in, no trip to Italy was complete without uh, seeing both Roman and Greek antiquities. We have both here. Uh, everything is carefully captioned, right? You show through the captions that you're really understanding what you're seeing. You're not just a a tourist taking snapshots, but this is part of, of an educational and, and sort of process of, of self-edification. Um, the script is quite interesting because it's this, this very loose flowing cursive, it's very modern, and it contrasts quite sharply with what we are going to see on this slide, uh, which marks an, an interesting break in both the subject matter and in the presentation of the Salzmann's private photo albums from this period. 
This is 1937 when German Jews were already subject to very heavy restrictions in lots of areas of life. Um, and it is uh, interesting that the Salzman's 1937 holiday documents something that becomes much more emphatically German. So the, the frontispiece, if you like, on the first sort of page of the album, this is the reverse of, of, of the physical cover, we see a scene of the Alps. The Alps were seen as a, a sort of quintessentially, if you like, Germanic space. Um, they featured very heavily also in Nazi propaganda. Hitler, of course, ha uh, had uh, his own mountain retreat in the Alps where he spent more time in the end than he spent in the German capital city of Berlin. Um, and the Alps were presented as this sort of spiritually elevating landscape. Um, so what did the Salzmanns do at this point? They traveled to the Alps. Um, they travel on the new Nazi-built motorways, another major feature in German propaganda. The motorway is the way of mobility and speed and the excitement of modernity, but it is also presented as a vehicle that takes Germans out of the cities and into the countryside to put them in touch with the, the spirit of German nature and hence the kind of spiritual essence of the fatherland. And again, that the Salzmanns are very ostentatiously participating in this precisely at the moment when Nazi propaganda is saying, this is not for Jews. If you're Jewish, you can't understand this. You can't appreciate it. You shouldn't be doing this. This is also the year when lots of these Alpine holiday resorts putting up signs, Jews are considered undesirable here. This is exactly the moment when Salzmanns is saying, this is us. We are fully part of this culture. We will not let ourselves be excluded from it. Um, you see a typical page from, from, from this album. What is also interesting is you could see there in the middle, the little girl is Eva. Uh, uh, who they've dressed up in the Lederhosen, these, these, these traditional folkloristic costumes. Again, lots of pictures of Hitler in Lederhosen. It's a tradition that dates back much, much longer, especially in Bavaria. But it's, it's, it's this sort of folksy rootedness of German culture that is becoming very popular in this period, and the Salzmanns take part in this. When they're not doing the Alps on the same holidays, they're doing Gothic cathedrals. Uh, German Gothic cathedrals are, uh, again, uh, very important in the cultural politics of this period, and Salzmann's finding it very important to show their appreciation for these cultural roots and traditions. Uh, another interesting one is the inclusion of Nuremberg on the left uh, uh, on this trip, and here a picture of the, the typical high-pitched roofs of this Renaissance city, which was, of course, completely flattened in the Second World War, so it doesn't look like this anymore. Um, but for those of you who are familiar with the Leni Riefenstahl film, Triumph of the Will, you may recall that it starts with a long sequence where Hitler is arriving in an airplane at the Nazi party and, and your Nazi party rally, flying over the roofs of Nuremberg, uh, pictured almost exactly like they are here. The Nazi regime is the only regime in the world, by the way, that, that had a racial theory about the exact angle of roof pitch and legislated on the minimum roof pitch for German houses because flat roofs or only slightly pitched roofs were deemed un-Germanic. So these very high pitched roofs have a particular ideological significance. On the right, again, you see uh, the Salzmanns with the youngest daughter, Eva, here in the Lederhosen. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Now, by uh, in the course of the year 1938, the Salzmanns realized that all their efforts to defend their proper Germanists, notwithstanding, uh, they were not going to have a future as a Jewish family in Nazi ruled Germany and start making preparations for emigration, an emigration which finally succeeds in 1939. Um, what is interesting is that the process of immigration itself is the subject of several photo albums. Um, so they're documenting everything, like uh, packing up the flat. Here you see them uh, cleaning up after they have moved all their, all their belongings out. You see several pictures that um, are about that, that moment of, of departure. This is the older daughter of Ruth here writing, presumably a diary or a letter, surrounded by the suitcases that are already packed for the trip. Um, and photos of the belongings being loaded into shipping containers, ready for shipping to New York, which is the destination of their emigration. They've managed to 
uh, uh, obtain visas, uh, which of course very difficult, um, and they sailed on the Iberia. The Iberia was the last ship of its kind to leave Germany with almost exclusively Jewish refugees on board. The ship that sailed a few weeks later on the same route uh, via Cuba, Havana to New York was the St. Louis, which of course was famously turned back by American immigration, sending nearly all of its passengers to their death in the Nazi gas chambers. The Iberia was three weeks earlier, uh, was still allowed to land and the Salzmanns were on board of that. So why are they photographing the emigration in this way? It could be simply this is a momentous event that they want to document. But if you look at these photos in conjunction with their, their letters and their diaries, I think there's another motif here. Germany has had a long history of emigration, not just Jewish immigration, but German emigration, uh, which really accelerated in the 19th century with a, a very large number of transatlantic crossings and very lively German speaking communities set, being set up in the New World. New York itself is the biggest, the largest German language newspaper in this period is published, the Aufbau is published out of New York and not out of Germany, um, that caters to a German expat audience globally. Um, so the Salzmanns have a very strong sense that, yes, they're leaving the physical place that is Germany, but they're not leaving their Germanness. They're instead uh, fitting or slotting into a pattern of German transatlantic migration that allows them to connect with a different set of still very German traditions. Um, these are pictures that they take on board the Iberia. Uh, picture on the left there shows little Eva on the rocking horse being teased by, by another boy, and on the right it's Hans Salzmann on the, on, in the onboard swimming pool on, on the Iberia. So this is being uh, depicted not just as a history of trauma, but also as a, a like a, a a narrative about adventure and new beginnings. In America, uh, the first thing that the Salzmanns do is photograph their new lives with the cameras that they had, of course, taken with them. And what I found particularly interesting is the way in which this technique of you know, placing oneself in significant spaces, significant landscapes in front of significant monuments, that are sort of markers of a country's identity is something that is simply transplanted into a new setting. So again, we have the photos of travel by car. We see here Hans Salzmann leaning against the new car. That was the first big purchase that the Salzmanns made after their successful emigration, um, but with some tweaks to the previous German habitus. So there is definitely a sense of the sort of several nods, let's say, to American culture, the, the sort of the baseball cap, the fact that he's now wearing sneakers and trying to reimagine himself as, as, as a little bit American, or the photo on the right, where they are with some friends on, on Coney Island enjoying a, 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 you know, a Saturday, Saturday away from their new home in Manhattan, relaxing and having fun. So that combination of, of leisure and exploration and mobility all captured or indeed performed for the camera is, is a recurring motif. Interestingly, this seemingly private practice was not completely private. Hans Salzmann during this period switched from taking uh, print photographs to taking slides. Sadly, his collections of slides are not preserved, but we, we took some paper photos in time, so we do have some albums from this period. And what is really interesting is that he showed the slides not just to his own family and friends, but he turned the slideshows into semi-public semi events in New York, advertised here in the aforementioned paper, The Aufbau, in this interesting bilingual ad, where he is showing the slides uh, to, um, in an event here titled The Trip to the Most Beautiful Spots in Our 50 States. So we definitely a buy -in into you know, we are now in America, we are projecting this way of placing one ourselves in this, in this new national landscape uh, in, into an American context and, and making that an experience that is to be shared with others. Uh, photo albums from the same time show what these slides might have looked like. 
in Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, uh, is you know, a key American national site, and the Salzmans are going there and photographing themselves in front of it in much the same way as they had done previously with the Alps or with German cathedrals and so on. So there's a, a performance of their new German, as uh, their new American identity, but it's done very much in, in the style and in the manner which they had learned in Germany and which they're simply reproducing in this new setting. Okay. So moving on to the uh, second case study, which I also stumbled across in an interesting way. The person on the top left is Otto Meyer um, from a German Jewish family, also from Berlin. Uh, some of you may recognize this image uh, because it became the kind of, this image became sort of the advertising poster almost of the, the old Yekes Museum in Israel. Uh, so the museum dedicated to the experience of German Jews or, or, or I should say Jews from German speaking parts of Europe who had emigrated to Monday Palestine, what became Israel. Um, and the, the nickname, of course, the Yekes comes from the fact that they take with them not just uh, their, their inner sense of German identity, but also their very Germanic attire with the, with the formal suits, the, the jackets. Uh, and this is an ironic commentary on that in this, in this picture, which shows Otto Meyer wearing his free piece, piece suit and carrying his briefcase in this landscape near Naharia in the north of Israel, uh, which, you know, is, let's say, not a setting that where you'd normally expect that kind of attire. Um, now I became interested in this story because Annette Folkman, um, you see her me there on the top right, and actually the very near the spot where, where the photo on the left was taken, uh, near, near Haifa. Um, uh, so Anat is a, an Israeli filmmaker, and she was working on a documentary film based on the huge archive of the Maya family, which again includes lots and lots and lots and lots of photo albums, narrating and documenting their experiences of as a, as a German Jewish family living in Berlin, then relocating to Reda, and from there in 1937 to what was then British Mandate Palestine. So Annette turned up in my house with her film crew there and filmed me for a week talking about these photos. So why is this story interesting? There are some really uh, interesting similarities. It's a very different family and nevertheless much that resonates with what I've just told you about the Salzmann family. First of all, the experience of the First World War as a, as a key moment through which one documents and indeed celebrates one's successful integration into German society. For many Jewish men, ser service in the German army during the, the First World War was the sort of definitive point of arrival. They were now full German citizens, no less German than everybody else. Emancipation had been completed uh, and everybody came together in this supposedly great patriotic enterprise of the First World War. Uh, so the photo here of, of, of uh, uh, Otto Meyer in, in, in the uniform, uh, surrounded by his wife and his, his children, but also in dressing up the, the child in this kind of Prussian uniform. And it becomes, it's not just documenting his own service, it's, it's a theme, a leitmotif, if you like, of this is us, we're Jewish, but we're also very, very German. Like the Salzmanns, the photos in the uh, 1920s and 19 early, uh, early 1930s uh, celebrate uh, the dual themes of consumption, uh, leisure, fun, the outdoors, being modern, you know, by, by the standards of the, the pre-war world. These are quite daring photos, you know, sitting there and, and scantily clad and just a, a modern kind of bathing suit, you know, nothing with kind of long legs and covering arms. Um, um, and also uh, participating in, 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 in very sort of German rituals. Uh, uh, Otto's wife, Gertrude, um, became uh, very interested in the history of, of German folk dances and uh, studied this, published a small, like a mini booklet on the history of, of German folk dance and also taught folk dancing. This is what we see in the park here. 
like the Salzmanns, uh, the Myers also went to Italy, um, which for them too was uh, a, an essential experience of a part of this, this German process of building and education, uh, cultural immersion and character formation through, through these things. There's an interesting twist here in that these pictures, uh, they're two album pages from their very, very large album. It's, it's not has got lots and lots of pages. These are actually very huge enlargements. Lots of the other pages have many, many, many smaller photos. They, they like the Salzmanns, they were proud of the aesthetics of their photos, making the photos look beautiful, doing interesting things with shapes, with lights and shadows was an integral part of demonstrating one's you know, aesthetic sensibilities, the meaningful cultural immersion, cultural participation, one is not just a tourist taking snapshots. But these photos were taken in 1937, already as part of their history of immigration. Now the um, Maya family were a little bit older than the Salzmanns. They had three children, uh, two of whom were already fully grown and had left uh, Germany earlier in the 1930s, uh, settling in Argentina. Um, the people left behind were the parents, the Maya parents and their youngest son, Andreas, who in 1937 was 17. And this is the point at which the Mayas decide that there is no future for them in Germany and they need to emigrate. And they emigrated via uh, Italy, catching a boat, uh, one of the clandestine boats to um, Mandate Palestine. Um, but en route, uh, they took the opportunity to do a cultural experience, a round trip of Italy, visiting Venice, Florence, Ravenna, Siena, um, various other places, uh, and, and do, doing this extensive photographic documentation. Uh, they say in their letters and diaries at the time that they thought it was crucial, especially for their youngest son, Andreas, to get that sort of this experience as, as rounding off his, his education in German and European culture before they're leaving both of these behind to make their new lives in, in Israel. So it's very poignant. It's also poignant that they were you know, Italy, while uh, in the pre-war years, less radically anti-Semitic uh, than Germany was nevertheless, of course, a fascist ally of Germany. And there was a, a great fear of getting caught and being sent back to Germany. And we know that the Mayas, during all these sightseeing trips, walked around, each of them with a cyanide capsule in their breast pocket, including one for the child, and they said that if they got caught, they would die on the spot rather than um, being, being letting themselves to be deported back to Germany. But with the cyanide capsule, they're still holding their Leica cameras in hands and uh, photographing beautiful Renaissance architectures, Renaissance sculptures, scenes of the Venetian Lagoon, and so forth. Okay, so... From there, uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, the, the departure photos themselves, again, are very much like the Salzmann's photos. They're showing the loading of the belongings onto the truck, the inevitable policeman there hovering in the background. You might have noticed him on the first Salzmann photo as well, uh, overseeing that everything's done in orderly fashion, also kind of you know, demonstrating a kind of the German authorities are watching you. Um, but photographing this process, as for the Salzmanns, was a, a key part of making sense, making meaning out of this experience of flight and displacement, as are the photos of the arrival. Um, so here is the same shipping container. You can see that it shipped from Berlin via Hamburg, which is, of course, the biggest the seaport in Germany. And then it says the name of the shipping company and then Maria via Haifa. Palestine. Uh, so here, the the woman to the right of the of the container is is, is Gertrude Meyer, uh, overseeing the arrival and unloading of the container with their belongings, in this radically different setting. Because of course they are very much not in New York. They are very much not in the city. They are in Naria, which is then a tiny tiny village, um, being turned into a town almost exclusively by Yekes, almost exclusively by German Jews. A lot of the land had been purchased 
uh, by Mr. Löwy, who uh, sold it off in parcels to German Jews as part of a conscious move to try and encourage them to emigrate to safety because he is worried for their safety if they continue to stay in Nazi Germany. So the, the Mayas are amongst the many German Jewish families who buy a parcel of land in Naharia from Mr. Löwy, where they now settle. Um, one thing that is different uh, from the uh, stories of the Salzmanns is that they keep going back to the beach where they landed and uh, photographing the arrivals of others who are following in their footsteps. So of course, at this time, the British authorities are letting very few Jewish refugees into Mandate Palestine and they're blocking the ports. Um, I'm sure you've all, you're all very familiar with the story of the, the exodus and these, these, these uh, tragic uh, uh, interceptions that continue even after the, after the Second World War where they're preventing these, uh, these Jewish crowds from landing uh, and, and arresting people and, and putting them in internment camps and Cyprus and wherever. Um, so a lot of these, these boats are simply anchoring off the beaches of northern Israel and people are coming ashore on these, on these tiny little dinghies and the, the Mayas keep going back to the beaches to photograph that process. So it's definitely there too. It's a story of being the migration as part of a, a broader history, a collective experience, but it's not so much the, the traditional German transatlantic story it's about a story specifically of Jewish migration to Mandai Palestine to, to, to create and found a new Jewish homeland, a new Jewish state. Now, of course, the conditions in which they, the, the, the Mayas found themselves um, are very, very primitive. There's very little there in the area. There really isn't a town to speak of. A couple of things I wanted to draw your attention to in, in these photos here. Um, First of all, the houses, one of which is the, the Maya's own house there. They're a little bit different from one another. The one on the left is very kind of modernist. The, the other one has the, the very Germanic high-pitched roof. Uh, but they are in their different ways, uh, very emphatically German. Uh, and I think it is in many ways that the way they're photographing this is, is about you know, creating a kind of outpost of Germanness, if you like, in, in this new land. Um, there's a good deal of humor in the photographs uh, and the attempts at, 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 at various methods for making new livelihoods for themselves. The first thing they try is chicken farming. You see Gertrude there with, with the chickens. They're part of speaking, chicken farming goes horribly wrong. They're urban people, they know very little about chicken farming. They also don't understand the climate, but that's their, that's their first attempt. Another attempt is to set up a hairdressing salon. Their English isn't that good, so they spell it as saloon. Um, one on the right, incidentally, is the uh, one of the older sons who had previously immigrated to Argentina, who later comes to see them and spends a few months with them in 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 the area uh, there with the with the car. Okay, um, so the 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 last thing before I I, I reach my conclusions, I want to do this quickly so we have time for questions and discussion. Um, is when I say a sense of humor, this is this is an even more pronounced. Uh, sense of humor and perhaps a, a crucial coping strategy for having one's kind of German culture displaced into what is to all intents and purposes still a desert. Um, so the Mayas uh, produced a cabaret in Naharia um, about their failed attempts, a humorous cabaret about their failed attempts at chicken farming. So you can see photos here from the rehearsals uh, where everybody's dressed up in chicken costumes and you see a bit of stage set there in the background with the, with the chicken eggs. Very keen to document this. Um, but the funniest thing about the cabaret, which we don't see in the photos, but we know from written documents, is that the music, the tunes, were Schubert leader. Schubert being one of the leading composers of German romanticism and particularly famous for this genre of, of, of the lead, the, 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 the sort of short romantic uh, song, uh, usually composed as, as, as part of a cycle. So um, the, the Schöne Müllerin, which is the, the, the Miller's daughter, is, is, is one of his uh, uh, famous song cycles or lead cycles, or the, uh, the Winterreise, Winter's Journey, is another one. So they're taking the, the music 
of traditional, you know, the archetype of German romanticism in music. And they're writing new lyrics to these songs, which are now about the failed attempts of doing German style chicken farming in this unfamiliar environment of Nahuatl, talking about the portability of German cultural identities to new contexts. I think that is a, a, a very nice summary of the, uh, the, the, the sort of knowing performance as well as the, 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 the humorous twist uh, that they're, they're giving on their own identities as, as Yekes trying to build uh, new kind of German style lives in an environment that is really very radically different from what they were used to. Okay, so uh, my conclusions. Um, so first, I think I want to reiterate something I was hinting at in the introduction. Photography, it documents experiences, but it does more than that. It is a prompt, uh, the activity of photography, photographing each other, photographing other family members, posing for the camera, photographing within friendship groups and friendship circles. It's a prompt for recording the self as what I've called here as a historical subject. So always situating the self in relation to others and in relation to exterior spaces. Uh, so where a diary might reflect only on inward thoughts, the photo, the practice of private photography is a powerful prompt for individuals to constantly think of where do I fit? What is my place in the world? What is my place in the public sphere? Uh, how do I position, how do I defend and reassert my sense of self in an increasingly hostile anti-Semitic environment back in Germany? And how do I reposition that self in the new environment, uh, in, in the different locations to which displacement and refugeedom took uh, these people? Secondly, like diaries, each story is extremely individual. And I, for one, would be very reluctant as a historian to sort of chop them up into pieces and say, well, you know, these are, you know, let's look at 200 photos that people took on these transatlantic boats. Or let's look at, look at 500 photos of, you know, the first few pictures they took up the few houses. I think following each story and seeing how identities are um, reimagined and adapted to these experiences without ever losing that sense of self and the continuity that comes with that, that's really important. But I also think it's interesting to bring a comparative perspective to this endeavor because different as all of these stories are, there are nevertheless certain patterns of meaning making or it's my one tiny bit of jargon and plotment is termed by Hayden White. So how one constructs a, a sort of chaotic series of life moments into, if you like, a coherent plot uh, that is, is foregrounds one's own agency, right? They, these, these stories are never about simply what was done to people, but, but what do people do in response to these situations? How do they take charge of their lives? How do they take charge of making sense of their own selves and these experiences. Um, so these processes follow certain patterns with individual differences between them, but we can nevertheless, as we've seen in these very different stories of two families who come you know, from different social backgrounds, who end up in radically different places, and nevertheless, uh, there's a certain, if you like, choreography uh, uh, to, to these albums as they run over the years, that I think is really interesting. Finally, uh, none of them really shed their German identities. Uh, and it is, I think, important when we think about this, that German identities were, had been mobile ones in lots of ways before this moment of forced exile and displacement. Uh, Germany had been, uh, Germans had, uh, had been comparable only, I think, in the 19th century to Ireland and the south of Italy, a key exporter of people 
to all over the world. There were lively German communities all over um, Asia, Africa, and both North and South America that had massively grown in size in the 19th century. And this was very much part of German identity as it was conceived in Germany as well. This idea of, of, of an expansive, globalizing and globe trotting German identity. And that I think was part of what helped German Jewish families to think of their migrations, not as a radical break, not as an absolute break with their German past. Also, one might talk about histories of, uh, if you like, smaller scale mobilities, of course, um, Germans and German Jews had moved within Germany a lot. This was also a society that had been very, very rapidly industrializing and urbanizing at a pace that is, is pretty unprecedented uh, across Europe. No society urbanized and modernized as radically quickly as Germany did in, in the decades around 1900. Uh, so by the start of the 20th century, you have all the big German cities where more than 50% of the population were not born in that city or any comparable city. So you have really mass mobilities within the country. So mobility as such is, is a concept for which there are cultural templates to make sense of it that already exist and are very much part of the culture. How these German identities were reimagined after immigration, of course, was very much influenced by the different cultures of the, the places that people found themselves in. Um, and I've introduced you here to two case studies, but would, one could expand this endlessly by talking about uh, millions of other people of German Jewish heritage to end up all over the world. And I'm sure that we find an incredible range of different hybridizations I've today only talked about two. So I will stop here and I very much hope there will be some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maiken, for a really fascinating talk and for sharing with us some of those fantastic, rich materials that you've pulled out of the archives. I mean, just terrific and so much one could do to unpack them. Um, so I've had a few questions come through, um, a few that everyone has seen and um, a couple to me, so I'll I'll go through them uh, one by one, um, and we'll we'll have about thirteen minutes. So I'll try to get through as many of them as I can. But apologies in advance if if we don't manage to get to all of them. Um, I'll start with David Freund's question, and he he's asking about um, the Zaltzmans' wealth. He says they seem very wealthy compared to other refugees, um, especially given how late they were leaving Germany. How did they manage to retain this wealth given all the restrictions that were placed on Jews? leaving what were their professions? Very good question. Um, so uh, uh, Jews were not allowed to take significant sums of capital with them, that money was stolen. It's one of the reasons why immigration photos can look uh, really deceptive. A lot of people bought uh, first class passages because your money was going to be taken away anyway. You couldn't take it with you, so you might as well blow everything you have on the ticket. Uh, the Salzmanns would never, under normal circumstances, having uh, have travelled first class on the Iberia, which explains the swimming pool on board. They were they're difficult to classify socially. Um, they're not particularly wealthy. Uh, they are Hans Salzmann is a doctor. Um, his wife is works as a, a, a medical masseuse, but they run a very humble practice out of a working class apartment in Kreuzberg in Berlin, which is an emphatically working class district. They're also socialists. They're members of the SPD in Germany, which at this time is still a properly socialist party. Uh, and they do a lot of pro bono work for working class uh, 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 patients who don't have medical insurance. Uh, so actually, they're not particularly affluent, although they are quite highly educated. Um, but they were from living in a very humble working class apartment in a very much a working class district of Berlin. And um, I'm mentioning this uh, in detail because they, what I said earlier about photographs, they're always a little bit, um, you know, aspirational. They don't document the quotidian, the boring, the ordinary. And they can be socially a little bit deceptive because of that. A lot of people look like they're having quite glamorous lives when in reality they aren't. Um, people dress up for photographs. Um, I think I know from my own family, my, my grandmother 
um, was very, very poor from Hamburg, but she would borrow from her, her sister who had married a, a more affluent man. She would borrow the nice clothes for the photograph. So suddenly she's sitting there in a fur coat. She didn't own a fur coat. She no way she could have afforded a fur coat. She didn't know how to get the table, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the food on the table for the family. Um, but there she is in a fur coat suddenly in a picture. Um, I think that's quite a typical thing that they, that, that, photos in this period nearly always involve a degree of posing and, and dressing up, which often suggests a higher social status. Not saying that the Salzmanns were poor, they're not, and they are quite well educated, but they're not nearly as grand bourgeois as they're seen in these, in these photographs. But it is undoubtedly true that um, photography is broadly speaking a middle class practice. You do get it amongst um, what we might call the petty bourgeoisie, so small shop owners and so on uh, are doing it as well, but you're missing the more rural Jewish populations, we're missing the, the very older generations who don't have younger relatives, it's, it's more a, a thing that people under the age of 40 do, the purchase of cameras, um, and we're also missing a properly working class dimension in this source space. That said, the same is true for written documents. Uh, it's very rare that working class people keep long reflective diaries about their experience as well. It's a selection bias that comes with the nature of, 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 of history and class in this period. Mm. Thanks. So there's a question from Jane Hunt, which um, casts a gender perspective or asks that we cast a gender perspective on these archives. And she asks, first of all, most of the photographers men um, and then she asks a very specific question, which is, did women ever narrate stories along with the photographs that might reach the level of literature? But with Jane's permission, I would expand that also and ask about what kinds of narratives people did write alongside their photographs and what that looks like. Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, my experience, photo cameras get passed around a lot. So um, it probably is the case that men are often the instigators, uh, also often as the, the kind of the budget holders, they're the ones who make the decision to go and buy the camera. Um, but you know, we have almost as many photos, I would say, of Hans Salzmann as we do of his wife, i.e. his wife was taking the photos. Um, so they photograph each other. Um, so it's not simply men holding the camera. Um, and I think this is this is quite typical and get the same outside the confines of, 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 of Jewish history in Germany in this in this period. You get school children photographing each other, especially on the school evacuation programs. You get people in uh, all the Nazi organizations photographing each other. It's, it's very prominent in the women's only organizations just as much as it is in the men's. So I don't think there's a huge gender discrepancy there. And album making is also interesting because the primary photographer is not always the album maker. Quite often, it's often hard to prove who made the album, who assembled the photographs, who made the captions. Um, but sometimes I get clues from the handwriting where I also have other documents in the same handwriting. and I can therefore tell it's the woman who made the album. Uh, um, you know, I can't give you a figure, but uh, my, my, my anecdotal impression, it's more than 50% of the time, it's the woman uh, of, of a household who assembles the album and who makes the caption. But of course, again, we can't tell to what extent was this part of a collective decision? Are they sitting around the table together? Or is it just the woman sitting there doing this? But it's definitely something that involves a lot of female agency. In terms of narratives, very often they are oddly dis disjointed. So we have um, letters, sometimes diaries on the one hand, and then we have narratives in the photos on the other, but they don't directly match up. So you have you have texts in photo albums in the forms of captions, sometimes more, sometimes there are pages that are of poetry or other commentary in, in, in the photo album as well. Um, but perhaps because what I was saying, because photography is a, a prompt for, for recording slightly different things, that you know, the diary is often the much more everyday stuff. This is what we ate. This is what we this is what's happening at work. This my husband is 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 angry about this, or so on. Um, whereas the photo albums are all about this is the Sunday outing, this is the leisure activity, 
this is the the exciting party that we organize this is us taking a stroll down the high street and window shopping and and, and so on that stuff never occurs in the written ego documents so i'm not saying one source is better than the other i think it's fascinating to read them in conjunction but they really document quite different aspects of life thank you so we have lots of questions coming in but um I'm afraid we're not going to get through all of them, but I'm going to go straight to Eliza's question, which is about um, Jews German identity. And she asks whether the families didn't reconsider their German patriotism once the full horrors of the Holocaust became clear. Did it make them question their identities as German rather than Jewish? Um, again, very difficult to quantify. Um, anecdotally, my sense is not so much. Um, it depends a little bit on the attitudes of the of the the, the host society. Uh, you know, in 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 America, of course, there are huge German speaking communities up to the the Second World War, when it it's generally deemed to be unpatriotic to speak German, and many families then decide to switch to English as the primary language of family communication. Uh, so linguistically, probably you can observe a shift over time. I would say it's more generational shift is that the kids who go to, grow up there and who go to school in America then learn that country's language in school. So German gradually fades into the background. Um, but in terms of the, the people who, you know, the, the first generation of people who, who migrated, my sense is that they, they cling on to their their German identity, and it's almost a, we will not let the Nazis deprive us of, of this, right? And why should they? It's this kind of crazy Nazi idea that you have to be either Jewish or German. And so much of German cultural productivity in the preceding centuries is Jewish. There is no German culture that isn't also Jewish. In any field you look at, theater making, music, I mean, even Hitler, right? his favorite composer is Moses Mendelssohn. It's a big embarrassment for the, the Nazis because the guy is Jewish, but Hitler is, is fascinated by the music. Um, architecture, painting, filmmaking, advertising, you know, they're, 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 all of these fields are unthinkable without the massive German a uh, Jewish contribution to at the heart of German culture. The idea to disentangle them is crazy. Um, I, I won't go into too much detail because there'd be another talk, but I think a lot of the, the radicalism of the Nazis comes precisely out of the difficulty of disentangling these two projects. It's not just a kind of hatred of the other. Here's a clearly segregated group and we don't like them. It's precisely because German culture is is so Jewish at its very heart um, that it's it's a bit like if you're thinking of sort of religious wars, think of the German Reformation, the, the violence that is associated with Protestantism trying to break away from Catholicism when it was one religion. And this is kind of similar, it was one culture and these crazy rituals of obsessive purification come precisely out of the fact that they can't be disentangled. So why should these Jewish people suddenly accept that, oh, we're Jewish, we're therefore not German? I think they, they don't. And, and why should they? they? They're hanging on to what was a, a, a shared cultural identity in which they themselves had a huge stake. Thanks. A very concise way of dealing with a very complex and rich topic. Um, I'll ask one further question, um, and for all those of you who have sent questions that Mike hasn't been able to answer, I will note them all down, um, and we will endeavor to get back to you with, with some of them. Um, I'll ask uh, a question that Gladwin um, posed, which is, she asks whether you, you knew these families or their descendants, and I suppose she's asking about getting hold of materials of this kind. Um, did you know the family or did you reconstruct their their stories from the albums alone? And she says, should we all donate our albums in case our times become historic? Um, which which I pose to you deliberately, yes. because actually I think there is a big question there for us historians. So. Please. Yes, absolutely. Please do donate your albums. Uh, we would love to have them. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it's it's such serendipity that some of these have ended up in, in publicly accessible 
archives. And I'm very conscious of how much history we lose because people don't realize that these seemingly private stories are such an important part of the history, which we shouldn't tell in this top-down way, just through you know, official actors. And the perpetrator story, right? That they are classic, even of who is Jewish, right? All the figures we see in public education, every museum wall, are, are using the Nuremberg race laws definition of who's Jewish. It's crazy. So we we absolutely need this material to write better history. So yes, please be please donate these albums if you have them. In terms of my stories are principally constructed from um just the archival holdings. Uh, so Ruth Salzman, who gave the things to his archive in Iowa, passed away uh, about eight years before I found the materials. However, what I didn't know is the younger daughter, Eva, was still alive. The archive was unaware of this. After I published my book, Eva got in touch with me. She now lives in Arizona. She's in her 90s and she is totally lovely. And we've had lots and lots of conversations that have prompted me to write a few sort of follow-up articles on the topic where I reflected on some of the conversations I had with Eva, but it wasn't part of the original research. I didn't even know she was still alive. Andreas, by the way, sorry, Andreas uh, passed away a couple of years ago. So we have some um, interviews with him that we conducted and that are not filmed, um, but he's now no longer alive. I guess we are at that historical tipping point where sadly everybody now passes who experienced these histories firsthand. Mm. Well, Michael, thank you so much for bringing um, two of those, two of those stories to us and for conveying them in such an engaging and such a rich way. Um, big thanks on behalf of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center and all of us for taking the time to talk with us. Um, our next talk will be in a couple of weeks time on the 1st of May, same time, 7 p.m. UK time. And that will be Professor Genevieve Zubrzycki from the University of Michigan who's going to be talking about the extraordinary Jewish revival that's been happening in Poland since the early 2000s and which has largely been driven by non-Jewish Poles who have a pass passionate interest in all things Jewish. Some of you may have uh, encountered this on visits to Poland. Uh, so please do join us for that the 1st of May um, at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, please, please do register to book your place. Um, otherwise, thank you so much once again, Mike, and thank you to all of us for joining us, all of you for joining us um, and hope to see you again very soon. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.